Hi, everybody, and welcome. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm Dennis Kelleher. I'm the president of Better Markets, which is a nonprofit advocacy group in Washington, D.C. And we're now entering the final stages of the conference, and it's great that you're all here because we really do have an all-star cast for a very important topic. Uh, I'm not presenting a paper, but I did want to uh, plug the one that I wrote that's on the website with this panel called Financial Reform is Working, but deregulation that incentivizes one-way bets are sowing the seed of another catastrophic financial crash. That, in that title intentionally echoes the panel's title, doubling down on failure, subsidizing more one-way bets. But by the time we're done, uh, we're going to echo more than the conference title, because you might conclude after this panel and listening to these papers that it might be better titled From Reawakening to Rude Awakening. And I, I say that not just because of my paper, uh, which talks about the deregulation activities in Washington, D.C., and how they are sowing the seeds for another crash, but also because of some of the discussion we're going to have shortly. Um, our first speaker is Ed, and Ed is a rock star. He's in disguise right now, but trust me, he's a rock star. He's been working on these subjects for so long and yet still brings a new perspective and new analysis that shows us, again, why it is we need to be worried about too big to fail banks. Ed's paper is a brilliant discussion of something actually Winnie alluded to at dinner last night, which is zombies. And his paper is a discussion of zombie banks very important in not only the United States, but across the world. Ed's going to talk about zombie banks, too big to fail subsidies, legal and regulatory loopholes, upside down incentives, very importantly, the revolving door and moral hazard and how we all pay for it and how we will continue to do so. Why, how, and a new way to actually measure that is the focus of some very exciting work that Ed's going to talk about. Ed's going to be followed by Anastasia. She has a new analysis of the asset-backed securities market. Now, remember, asset-backed securities were the components of the financial bombs that blew up in 07 and 08. That's why Warren Buffett called them derivative, that derivatives were weapons of mass destruction. They were more structured products than derivatives, but the point holds. Remember that Trump's national economic Council Chairman Gary Cohen is the former president of Goldman Sachs, and his bonus for the single year of 2007 was $70 million. And that's mostly because he unloaded Goldman's big pile of CDOs while simultaneously making a fortune shorting the market. Now, Anastasia's discussion is how that headline view of ABS, along with collateralized debt obligations and credit default swaps, has blinded us to some important features of the ABS market. And if you want to know if it's relevant or not on what, what us old guys call the front page of the Wall Street Journal or maybe the home page, although because it's refreshed so often it may be gone, but there's a very important article today in the, in the Wall Street Journal about the reemergence of CLOs and the leveraged loan market that goes right to the point that Anastasia is making about asset-backed markets. Very important paper. Wrapping up via uh, teleconference is going to, or video conference is going to be Professor Michael Greenberger, who has done some extraordinarily important work on derivatives, particularly regarding international regulatory arbitrage. And given that derivatives contributed significantly to the 08 crash, and very importantly, derivatives acted as the conveyor belt that distributed financial time bombs throughout the global financial system you want to pay close attention to what Michael's talking about. Now, they're going to be summarizing their papers, but I encourage you all to go to the website and read their papers. All the papers are posted there. They're well worth your time. And we're fortunate enough to, to also have two excellent people to discuss the papers. Professor Perry Merling uh, from INET, among other places. Uh, and as you all know, Dr. Robert Johnson, the head of INET, among other places. So without further ado, um, Ed, if you want to uh, jump in to zombie banks and wake us all up, that'd be great. Well, I hope nobody's asleep, actually. Anyway, my title is really two ideas that there are, most of the mega banks in Europe are uh, either actually zombies or on the edge of zombiness. 
and th that the regulatory arrangements are very deferential to their interests. So there's uh, th three main talking points. I, I think I gotta move this. <laughs> that I should be able to read my own ta talking points. Uh, so uh, the financial crises are, are not well understood, that they really are the last games, last stages of games of chicken that are initiated by the mega bankers. The, the bankers know, or certainly ought to know, that they can benefit personally from aggressively risking the ruin of their firm and then holding uh, the, the macro economy hostage and, and basically scaring the regulators into, into letting them uh, stay, stay in business in an uninterrupted way. Now, if we want to change the, the behavior of the banks, we have to recognize it's bankers whose behavior needs to be changed. And the regulatory systems of the world today focus on punishing banks. It's almost as if uh, the problem is reckless banking, much like reckless drivers. And if we punish the cars of the people that drove recklessly, we wouldn't expect to get much benefit. I mean, you know, put a dent in in the right front fender if you do one thing and put a couple more dents in the, in the back. So what my, what's new about my research, and actually Dennis has basically given my paper, uh, that is that it provides a, a new statistical way of, of um, assessing how much help taxpayers are providing and uh, it really supports, it's evidence that supports this chicken game model of exogenous financial crises. It supports the model by offering new ways of measuring the particular subsidies that are flowing through these markets. So uh, what the method does is track and compare changes in the, the ver various term, long-term and short-term probabilities of default uh, with how the credit spreads, that is the interest rates that have to be paid over government rates, and um, how, how much responsiveness there is in the, in the interest spread. And for zombie institutions, we'll see there is very little response. And for others that are near zombiness, we see a much reduced uh, effect. So what do I mean when I say that the zombie mega bankers play chicken with crisis managers? Is well, if you read any of these books about what was going on in in uh, in the Treasury Department in the few days as when they were trying to decide what to do about the crisis, the the big bankers were coming in and telling them how the world would come to an end. Basically, there'd be no more finance anywhere uh, if they didn't come in and save them. And they say, besides that, what's going to happen to the macro economy? Unemployment will be much more than otherwise, and so. The, the zombie banks are kept alive by the guarantees that these games of chicken extract, and these guarantees are getting more and more valuable over time. And these managers succeed in doing this by, in the period leading up to these last stages, cosmetically misrepresenting their economic condi conditions and pursue profit-making opportunities that uh, basically exploit their customers and counterparties and regulators' informational disadvantage. So here is a picture of what the global safety net looks like, uh, in fact. So if, if we look at it we, on the far left, your left, um, we see the, what are called sometimes the gypsy um, elements of, of uh, the EU, um, Portugal, Italy, Spain, uh, and, and Greece, of course, and they're, they're reaching for a bunch of money that has come out of, uh, I'm not really sure whether Germany is trying to get some of that money or throwing it, but the ECB and the EU are providing money, and then the IMF has been watching this and realizes that it, it is, of course, the international element of the safety net, and they it turns around and says to the U.S. taxpayer, we may need some help if this doesn't work. And, and I, I'm saying here that the US taxpayer is the sturdiest element of the safety net as the, the size of these uh, 
hidden losses in, in European zombie banks keeps expanding. So the, the, the basis of people believing the Federal Reserve stands behind these European banks is uh, continuing evidence of post-crisis support and, of course, the huge amount of crisis support. If you get a hold of my paper, you'll see a documentation of the trillions of dollars, really, that the Federal Reserve lent to the big banks in Europe. But they continue to have currency swaps and interest on foreign bank deposits at the Fed. You know, foreign banks are paying negative interest rates to each other and are able to get uh, uh, substantial amounts of, of, uh, of what is an arbitrage at the Federal Reserve. Now, it, this has allowed the country regulators in Europe to give zombie institutions the benefit of what we could call the accounting doubt. That is, they don't show that they are deeply insolvent or even a little insolvent, uh, but that's because they managed to keep their bad loans holding at par, uh, either by paying them off, lending people the money to pay them off and start them over again, perhaps with a different subsidiary. And that you can see in these currency swaps that much of their purpose is every quarter they expand tremendously right at the reporting date, which allows the, these banks to improve their balance sheet. Okay, now, my main point here is that post-crisis arrangements for resolving crisis, uh, resolving banks in future crises sounds very good, but th these are largely a bluff. And, and I have a cartoon to make the point that here is a shell game going on and um, this, this is uh, the regulators and the regulator is saying uh, see, we're putting new regulations on banks to protect the world's ordinary citizens. And the uh, customer is looking sort of blank at this. And there's this very small little part. This is a cartoon by a man named Toll, who always has a, a topper at the bottom of his cartoons. And, he, and so it's sort of like what would be the next picture in the panel, saying, now watch, I shall demonstrate. And that's what we're seeing. So why is this a problem? Why don't these regulations work? Well, I've thought about this problem a long time, as Dennis suggested, and I've come, come to the conclusion that it really has to do with the regulators' culture and how they see their job. And so it isn't that they don't think these rules are helpful, but when it comes to a, a tough situation, the last stage, the early stages of a crisis, that giving them more supervisory and resolution authority doesn't change the norms and, un and shared assumptions that govern the exercise of this authority. So let me just focus on the two red ones, but to justify this, I use the methods of cultural anthropology. For about 60 years, I have served in various capacities in the Federal Reserve System, at the board, at, at uh, at least three banks, and I've gone to conference after conference where I've had discussions with these people. So I'm saying first, they see the, the culture of regulation thinks it's not only all right, but a good thing for, for big banks to hide losses. They think that's just fine, and that's because it makes sure that we won't have a run uh, the, and they, as a result, have to try very hard uh, to understate their tolerance for non-performing loans. So we see a lot of non-performing loans in uh, Europe, but, okay, and secondly, we have the mer this sort of mercy norm that they, they feel that uh, they need to help firms to get in trouble, and uh, they also have a benefit of the doubt norm that they, if they don't trust the accounting, they'll give a firm a benefit of the doubt for a long time. And, and now uh, the norms of individual career management uh, include blame avoidance norms, which I think you've seen in many bureaucracies, that rocking the boat or challenging higher ups is a kind of career suicide. And the other point, which is that it's okay to nurture one's post-government employment and speaking opportunities. And many of the people that brought, brought us the crisis have made a lot of money in the process. All right, so these norms lead to, to, to what I call the culture-driven megabank bailout model of central bank behavior. That is to say, it's a, saying that the culture gives us too big to fail 
and just changing rules on banks as opposed to bankers is not going to correct it. Now, the second part of it is the dur durability of concealment and benefit of the doubt norms at regulators and central banks. That is these norms that I just talked about. And the third is the high correlation of standalone default probabilities across major banks in the US and EU. And it's sort of one form of evidence of the existence of the mega banks in Europe is the, that uh, seven months ago when I first let downloaded these correlations in the um, pairs of, of mega banks, the, uh, the, these correlation coefficients between the European banks and the Bank of America were more on the order of 0 0.50, 0 0.60. They are now hurting. Okay, it seems unbelievable to me. Anyway, I, these figures are from October. So uh, that what I have to show you is evidence of bailout expectations. Of, of the, uh, the model is based upon 2.2 million observations and more than 2,700 defaults. Uh, the 30, 5,000 firms in 61 countries, it's updated daily, and the Federal Reserve subscribes to this service. All right, so here in this slide, we study 11 weak, weakest banks operating in the United States, regardless of their, where their headquarters is, uh, as a re, those who were subject to CCART stress testing in 2016. Now, if we just look at the last 10 year uh, cumulative probability of default, we see that these banks, which include Deutsche Bank, uh, Bank of Santander, BBVA, and um, uh, HSBC, all have very high 10-year probabilities of default, and even substantial one, uh, three-year probabilities of default. This is inconsistent with the promises we're given about all these reforms that have been put in place. So how a firm's credit spread moves in distress depends on how fully its creditors feel they are covered by the safety net. If you think the government is going to support the bank no matter what, it's, you expect its probability of default to go up, but uh, not to show in the credit spread. So the credit spread is the, the, the yield of the bond minus uh, the, the, the match maturity treasury. You're going to see the, the light blue line show the volume of trading, so the bonds I've chosen have a lot of trades. Uh, orange line will be generally the one year Kamakura uh, risk information default probability. The green line will be the 10 year unless otherwise noted. So here's an example to train you that this was General Electric. It's not really a financial firm, it has a financial component, but you see that um, the blue dots moved sharply in the crisis uh, and, and more or less covered this probability of default. Now, uh, and it's one year probability default works itself out slowly. All right, because the problems we slowly resolved. Here is Citigroup, that in the same period, it's probably default went way up, surged to the roof, and there's only a small uh, expansion in its uh, credit spread because there's always some chance that the government might not bail them out at this time. So uh, I've explained that the non-standard behavior and distress of these credit spreads says that somebody else is thought to be guaranteeing these, that is to say, the safety net. So here's Bank of America, the same pattern. Here's a very interesting case. Lehman Brothers was thought to be too big to fail. It had a surge uh, during the last couple months before its failure and its probability of default. Very little movement in its um, credit spread. But then in the last day, you can see the trades went through the roof until it was worthless. And we see the same thing in Banco Popular in Spain just a couple, a couple months ago. So using that U.S. experience as a touchstone, as, uh, notice here's Deutsche Bank, and we see two periods. We see what happened in the crisis. We also see that its surge actually predated the U.S. crisis, that this is where the crisis originated. Of course, it originated holding U.S. mortgage-backed securities. So it's not like the U.S. didn't contribute to it. But look what was happening at the end of 2016. There was a big battle over some fines that the U.S. Treasury was talking about developing. And so to get a better picture of that time period, I've got a bond that didn't exist now in the crisis. And you see the same thing, a surge in uh, the default probability and uh, very little movement 
in, in the credit spread. Here's Banco Santander, which took over Banco Popular. And again, uh, this is a bond that just, a long bond that was just issued uh, this year, late this year. And you see that uh, the long-term probabilities of default, even though it's a long-term uh, bank uh, bond, it, are more or less irrelevant. The people, we, yes, we will see that the crisis, uh, there's a prediction more or less that within 10 years we'll certainly have a crisis. Uh, this, case, this is a five year green, so, you know, but people are saying, I don't care what you've done uh, to try to change bank regulation. I don't think that my bond is not gonna be paid. All right, so then here is, um, I think it's credit, it, it, can you see it better? Anyway, it's Barclays to show you. Now all the British banks are like this, uh, just so you, you know that uh, it's had a surge in the one year default probability, even further surge in the five year, and uh, more or less what it is being priced here is the liquidity of the bond, the liquidity risk, that they may have some changes in, in interest rate levels. And so UBS and Bank America show the same pattern in recent years. Uh, and so I, 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 I needn't uh, deal with the rest of this, but let me just go to this last wing thing, which comes from a paper by Ferguson and Johnson, which I'm in here, that uh, why does a revolving door do so much business, all right? Well, the salaries of the top regulators here are compared with the incomes earned by the top managers in the private sector. And you see how this has surged from what people were calling today the golden age of the economy, that the, these regulators' salaries haven't kept up. So in order to really price your skills as a, as a regulator, as an executive, you almost have to plan to go back into the, uh, this, this sector. And, and uh, so you use this investment, this time, investment of human capital as a top regulator to build your reputation and this, doing this reflects, puts great constraints on what you're willing to do to discipline and anger banks in, in the economy. So, thank you. Thanks, Ed. If she's gonna go up there. Shall I say? Thank you. Um, my paper will be about debt. Uh, one of the many papers about debt. We seem to know a lot about the importance of debt. It's completely tried to say that we, are, we have become over-dependent on debt. For example, because global debt levels are now estimated to be over 300% of the world's GDP. But I would argue that debt, of course, comes in many forms and functions, and these aggregate figures only conceal those functions. One of those functions is, oh, belongs to instruments of securitization, to debts as financial instruments. Securitization has been widely blamed for the financial crisis in 2007, 2009. It's subsumed now in the discussions of shadow banking industry, and yet it remains important, although marginally it's only 5% of global capital market funding, but it is more important historically for the US, which is the largest securitization market in the world and the deepest capital market in the world. So this paper is about one particular instrument um, that is a form of structured credit, um, but that is easily confused and conflated with other toxic securities that have been, just as Dennis was introducing, at the heart of the Malays in 2007. These are asset-backed securities. If you want their first floor paper between the ground floor, more traditional securities, bonds issued by governments and corporations, and more complex kind of second floor securities, um, that you see movies about, CDOs, CDO Square, synthetic stuff, really an alphabet of paper. Um, so these asset backed securities have a very important but largely uh, overlooked function in today's finance, and our paper with 40s is really about that. Um, this graph is from one of the uh, fund, funds in, in London, and the purple uh, rectangle really represents private label ABS issue, although all of the categories of structured credit instruments are essentially asset-backed securities. Um, it's about a $10 trillion market uh, globally, and private label um, is just over $1 trillion out of it. 
Again, coming back to 2007, it was this stuff that crushed the system that spread the contagion, collateralized debt obligations. Um, the issuance went through the roof in about four years, between 2003 and 2007. Um, nobody was really paying attention to them initially. You know, they, they thought that it would be priced, and then one day it couldn't. So remember this graph? And now we have something else. This is the statistics from today. Something called CLOs, collateralized loan obligations. Very similar structures, only they're stuffed with debts not from consumer um, finance um, and households, but from businesses, sometimes really bad businesses or very, very bad business affairs of, of firms. Um, they've been on the rise, and apparently Wall Street Journal has just um, um, had its own view on that. And um, you can see they're at pre-crisis or even above levels today. In 2006, there were two deals matched, and they are, seem to be the historic all-time high for CLOs. It's a little bit worrying, possibly even more worrying than a little bit, because there is a reason why investors are choosing these complex securities. Um, there are risks of artificially inflating them, of mispricing them, and again, of ignoring all the stuff that already had happened to the system. There are two main reasons why investors are putting their money into it. One is that there's been a massive regulatory onslaught on the financial system since 2009, and these tight regulatory constraints are actually preventing the production of those first floor securities, the asset-backed securities that would be needed or that, that are very much needed by the investor base. The second reason is probably more interesting and perhaps even more dangerous. It's intellectual or I would say even doctrinal. Regulators don't really appear to um, understand the nuances of securitization. They don't really appear to be paying too much attention to the problem of demand, of investor demand and the political economy of that demand for yield. Um, and therefore, this again, the functionality of IBS in, in the financial system today is ignored. You heard about financialization, very ugly term. Apparently, 50 definitions have been produced in academic literature. Most of those 50 definitions would say that financialization is about the increasing role of financial markets, interests, motives, and prices in our everyday life. On this graph um, that McKinsey put together a few years ago about the global stock of financial assets, of, of wealth, uh, financialization represents two trends. One is the move away from blue part of the graph towards the gray parts of the graph, away from bank-based funding towards capital market-based funding. And within capital markets, it's also the more proportionate role, the, the increasingly uh, large role of bonds as opposed to equities in, uh, in serving as a key financial instrument. And this has direct implication for um, the new, or the actual role of bonds as, as, as important instruments in political economy of finance today. The key role is, of course, for any bond, wherever, if, if you're a government, a local authority, university, um, a firm, is to get, get, get you money. It's a borrowing instrument. Um, it gets you, um, you know, relatively affordable capital if you can afford it, and you have to repay it back at a, at a future date. The second function of a bond is an investable security, and that's the demand side that tends to be overlooked in most of the debates. This function is absolutely central to large institutional investors that are very much you and me. These are pension funds, insurance companies, endowments, and asset managers, and, and everybody else. So the, sometimes, you know, these discussions about financialization is very much about finance vis-a-vis -vis the rest, finance vis-a-vis -vis the real economy, but there is real economy just there, and it needs to be understood. Investors, of course, do give money to those issuing entities, to corporations, firms, and, and uh, local authorities, um, when, they, when they credit them. But they also use bonds for another purpose, for conservation, for conservation purposes, not so much for liquidity, not even so much for, for trade, but for conservation purposes. They use them as stores of value uh, for their clients. This is where they pour their clients' money, and this, they need to be able to extract value to meet the contractual obligations of their clients. We, our knowledge about bonds as debt is dominated by the first function. Every textbook you can get, most of the theory is written, is really about that first, the supply function. It's, it's about financing instrument. That's how they associate with debt uh, so strongly. We know very little about the second function. 
Um, again, there are two reasons for that. Historically, mainstream economics wasn't really interested in incorporating the all very, very complex issues about the financial system. Perry would, would even say it wasn't interested in incorporating finance at all. He developed a whole money view to, to say it in detail. At the same time, even for those who are trying, and I, I noticed several papers at this conference who are trying to do that with household debt, for those that are trying to work with finance and feed it into the macroeconomic models, there have been such profound changes in the organization of the financial industry as such, and in, into the institutional investors in particular, that we, for example, are far away from the time when Minsky wrote about money manager capitalism. It's, that capitalism has changed, and we now are in a very different system by scope and scale. There are many factors behind what Andy Holden called the rise of asset managers. On the one, you know, political, demographic, uh, political scientists, my colleagues would call it, you know, neoliberal politics. But the most important is, of course, sw the switch from universal pension provision to more specialized forms of welfare and pensions. As a result, mid to high income households have, have become, they had to become more yield oriented. They have to safeguard their financial future themselves. As a result, they came to rely less on bank forms of funding and more on capital market. While still being risk averse, they still need that professional manager to do it for them. So this is a graph illustrating the developments in Europe, in, in, in the Eurozone area, where the, the gray part of the graph is banks and, and, and deposits, and everything else is various types of financial instruments. You can see how proportionately more important it has become, apart from the few and abnormalities for Cyprus, uh, that is an offshore financial center, and Luxembourg, same thing. Institutional investors need to accommodate this large inflow of funds, and they tend to prefer bonds. Again, some people has, have called this process de-equalization. It's supposed to be rather bad. It's supposed to be one of those moves of finance away from the, from the interest of the real economy. And it might be quite bad from the production point of view. Firms and companies now are more constrained in raising, um, in raising uh, capital. However, from the point of view of the institutional investor, it makes a lot of sense. Because bonds, A, they help them manage their portfolios because it's a balance sheet operation, but also because bonds pay interest by law and not like equities who pay interest uh, by discretion. They're able to conserve value in these instruments for as long as prices of these instruments are stable, because of course bonds or any financial security doesn't have any intrinsic value. It, it's only valuable as long as the price is there. And here we come to this important but overlooked function of ABS paper. There can be structural mismatches between the demand and supply of bonds in the markets. Supply of bonds tend to, to fluctuate with business cycles. Firms and, and governments react differently to economic recessions or economic booms. Sometimes they cut their provision of bonds, sometimes they expand. But this, the, the demand for bonds is in, increasing monotonically. It doesn't really show any decrease, any, any fluctuation in, in retreating. In fact, the asset management industry is very bravely projected to grow by about 7 to 8% per, per year over the next two years. This is according to industry calculations. As we all age and as we all have you know, become more aware of the financial future, there will be more and more inflow of demand um, for those financial storage values. So there are quantity mismatches that are not really equilibrated by the price movements, not like in product markets, because prices for bonds cannot really go down because then they will lose their value storage capacity um, for the investors who are using them. So this extra demand has to find somewhere to go. It has to find a vent um, in the overall universe of financial paper, of financial uh, products. Um, as you can see, there are many functions and there are many forms that fulfill that. And ABS and private label asset backed securities are important, albeit small, fulfilling that equilibrating function. They have to, they have to be there to, to compensate for the structural imbalance between demand and supply. However, it's very difficult for them to do that because post-regulatory policy post-2009 has been, um, has at least suffered from two big problems. A, um, there has been a wide diagnosis that it's underestimation of risk by pretty much everybody who was there in the system, US households, the states, the banks, they all were doing something um, that they were not supposed to because they were mispricing the risk. 
Um, these diagnoses tend to square on the shadow banking system, including securitization processes, and including the production of financial securities and financial innovations that you know, could constitute the alphabet of structured credit, um, because they, are, they were the demerical uh, manifestation of all the miscalculation. And of course, regulatory policy has tended to focus on banks and not on the rest of the financial system. The story might, to an extent, be true, but it's certainly incomplete, because over half of the amount of these securities were created in a space of short, short four years, between 2003 and 2007. And our answer to why there were, you know, it's not like suddenly everybody woke, woke up in 2003, US households, US state, US banks, and started to undervalue the risk. It's because there was a massive inflow of foreign capital demanding US safe assets, um, and that demand couldn't find all of its scope in traditional paper. Some of it went into ABS paper, some of it went through subprime, and because at that time the production of ABS securities were constrained by the amount of creditworthy borrowers, um, they, they had to be producing the CDOs and the CDO Square and all the other um, you know, creations that, that became fashionable. So I just spoke to that. Today we're in a very similar position. It, the constraints today are not due to the lack of creditworthy borrowers, but due to tight and indiscriminate regulatory approach by the central bankers and financial institutions. You can see how both in the US and in Europe, securitization has shrunk massively um, since the crisis. It's supposed to be a good thing. They're congrat congratulating themselves on finally conquering the, um, the monsters of the shadow banking system. This comes from the Financial Stability Board um, which declared that aspects of shadow banking now have declined significantly and generally no longer pose financial stability risks. I could just end the presentation there saying, remember Minsky? Stability is always stabilizing. Every time you put something like this in, in an open public view, you know, beware. But I have two more slides. The report continues. They said that we are so good in this shadow banking system regulation that new consolidation rules to put all of balance sheet vehicles before that were there before on balance sheet, it will ensure prudential rules and prudential behavior by banks. But all this unfolds in the context of three big developments that are happening independently. There is a decline in, in production of that important bridge between supply and demand of, of bonds. Um, there is QE and the, its effects who have boosted immensely the super rich who provide additional source of demand for value storage assets because they want to get richer. And this demand has to shift to more complex stuff, which it has. It has shifted to CLOs. Therefore, and this is the final slide, the conclusion is that having failed to identify that important investor demand for, for value storage before 2000 crisis, the regulators are repeating the same mistake again. And Together, their actions and also poorly informed um, vision of the financial system um, might just risk creating all the preconditions for another financial crisis much sooner than they would have hoped. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Hi, how are you, Dennis? Everybody, this is Michael Greenberger. come to you uh, via Skype. Um, I am suffering from a retina detachment and I can't fly for another four weeks, which is uh, why I'm in wonderful Baltimore rather than Edinburgh. Uh, also, Dennis referenced that you can find papers and uh, other materials on the INET website. Uh, first of all, let me say I'm deeply indebted to INET, not only for the support they've given me for the paper I'm about to talk about, because, but because of the outstanding work INET has done uh, since its founding. Uh, just listening to the two prior papers, uh, those papers uh, would have trouble finding a uh, institutional outlet in the United States. Uh, and I'm very indebted to INET and to Rob and Tom, especially who I've worked with since the financial crisis in 2008 
and they've been uh, stellar uh, colleagues, companions, both substantively and personally. The subject I'm talking about today, and I, I, I must compliment the prior speakers, much of what they've talked about uh, supplements what I, my paper. And my paper essentially addresses the question. It focuses on the four biggest US swaps dealers in the United States, uh, JP Morgan, Citi, Goldman, and Bank of America. Those companies are organized under United States law. Their principal places of business are in the United States. Uh, they have uh, had access to the Fed window. Uh, they ran into serious financial calamities in 2008. They were bailed out uh, by the US taxpayer. Uh, I am focusing on those four institutions. The subject I'm talking about has been captured by the banks where there is no focus on these institutions. There's a one size fits all. And the question is whether the community banks, for example, will be unfairly treated with regard to the question I'm raising. Uh, on July 21st, 2010, the United States Supreme Court dealing with a SEC issue with transactions by non-US companies in Japan, uh, the question was whether the SEC's regulation could uh, apply to those companies. Uh, the United States Supreme Court on that day said, there is a presumption that a regulatory statute does not have extraterritorial effect unless Congress makes it clear that it does. Three days later, the United States Senate in considering Dodd-Frank and addressing the Supreme Court decision said that if the extraterritorial ter transactions could adversely, seriously adversely affect the US economy, or if the extraterritorial transaction is a ruse to avoid Dodd-Frank, Dodd-Frank applies. As we sit here today, those four big US bank holding companies are able to uh, assign, negotiate, and execute swaps in the United States, mostly Wall Street. But if they assign the swap to a foreign bank subsidiary, they're out from under Dodd-Frank. Now Dodd-Frank, as you know, uh, provides transparency, margin requirements, capitalization, consumer protections, anti-competitiveness, and the list goes on. But these banks can avoid this by simply sending their transactions, for example, to the United Kingdom. Uh, how did that happen? Well, uh, between 2010 and 2013, the CFTC promulgated over 50 rules implementing the spirit of Dodd-Frank. They let the question of extraterritorial impact go to last. And in July 2013, and I admire the work that the CFTC did uh, in those years, and Gary Gensler, who was the chair, uh, was responsible for those activities. But on July 2013, they adopted their extraterritorial interpretation. And let me say, generally, it was not something to be applauded. But as far as this issue is concerned, as I framed it, if a transaction was done by a guaranteed subsidiary of one of the big US bank holding companies, that subsidiary was deemed wherever it was located in the world, a US person and subject to Dodd-Frank. The key word was guaranteed. Now, the July 2013 uh, interpretation of extraterritoriality was massive. It had 662 footnotes. Interestingly enough, footnote 563 
of 662 footnotes was seized upon quietly by ISDA in August of 2013, and they rearranged the ISDA documentation so that banks could check off uh, a clause that allowed the banks to de-guarantee their guaranteed subsidiaries. Now, let me say when swaps were getting started uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, the fact that the is the documentation provided for the guarantee of foreign subsidiaries was very important to give assurance to the industry. By 2013, not so important because as many people have said in this panel, the implicit guarantee by the US taxpayer is more than enough. And knowing that it would not be a marketing problem, the four big US bank holding companies with the consent of their customers revised existing swaps agreements and future swaps agreements to de-guarantee foreign subsidiaries and took the position that because the subsidiary is not guaranteed, it's out from under Dodd-Frank. Now, arguably it's under the UK or the EU or Japan, but has, as has been so well articulated on this panel, the EU, Japan, and certainly the United Kingdom, which will have more flexibility after Brexit, have been a regulatory catastrophe. And they are nowhere near as uh, uh, transparent and cap capitalized requirements and margin as the US Dodd-Frank requires. So this has been a vehicle. Uh, some 95% of swaps, certain swaps transactions are no longer deemed to be United States transactions and are deemed to be the transaction of the de-guaranteed subsidiary wherever it is located. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the lack of stability in the economy as we confront it today. Uh, let me go back and say, I appreciate the importance of collateralized debt obligations and collateralized loan obligations. But the history of the meltdown was not just the absurdity of these instruments, but that they were insured by people trying to short the market. That's the subject of Michael Lewis's book, The Big Short. So what did that mean? These are called naked credit default swaps. These investors could pick among the tranches of CDOs that they didn't own and ensure risk that they didn't own. So if those uh, debt obligations fail, even though they didn't own it, they were fully insured and collected uh, for the losses. Uh, this goes back to the early 19th century uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, sharp trans transactors in the city were insuring cargo on British ships uh, that they didn't own. And then they would alert the French to where the ships were, the ships sunk, and they collected their insurance. It has been a standard rule of insurance since 1806 when Parliament said you can't insure other people's risk. Now, uh, we're hearing about the explosion of these indebted transactions. What I would tell you is for every indebted instrument you see, there are bets by people who don't own the obligation that those transactions will fail. That could not have happened under Dodd-Frank because Dodd-Frank requires too much transparency. But once you get out from under Dodd-Frank, you can sell insurance on that indebtedness. In the meltdown, there were three to four times as many naked credit default swaps 
as there were credit default swaps. That is, people who actually owned uh, or had liability coming from the indebtedness. And uh, studies have been done, uh, mo housing mortgage failures. You just didn't have the failure of the real mortgage, but there were mortgages that were bet on nine times to fail and money collected. So the uh, subject of the defaults was aggravated substantially. Now you will have seen since August, October 13, uh, announcements that the United States has agreed that uh, it will take EU margin requirements for uncleared swaps. In early 2016, the CFTC, being aware of this use of footnote 563, put a stop to it uh, as it applied to margin for uncleared swaps. So that's one of 13 different regulatory applications of Dodd-Frank's to swaps. So you have these four big banks now that are required to uh, use US margin rules for uncleared swaps. However, if they can convince the CFTC that the regulation is comparable in the country where the foreign subsidiary has done the transaction, the CFTC on October 13th said, we will accept EU regulation. And I think it's been made fundamentally clear here. Uh, EU regulation is nowhere near what Dodd-Frank is, although the CFTC is telling us as of October uh, 13th that it's comparable. It is comparable in the way that the First Amendment uh, is uh, in this uh, is comparable to the free speech protections in the Soviet Union's constitution. In language, it may be comparable, but in practice, it's not. And the zombie banks in Europe and the failing banks that were talked about earlier are a reflection of the weakness of the EU regulatory format. My final point. It may be that these four big banks are now able to deem these transactions, even if negotiated in New York, as London or Germany or Japan. That's moved abroad. What hasn't moved abroad is the risk to the American taxpayer. Because as, been, as has been made very clear on these panel discussions, if JP Morgan, Citi, Goldman, Bank of America fail, it has already been built in to economic expect expectations that the taxpayer will bail them out. And if they fail as AIG did because of its London subsidiary, or if they fail for transactions like the one London whale done under JP Morgan, it will not be the British, it will not be the European Union taxpayers who will bail them out, it will be us. And I think the point has been very well made that in fact, the EU is looking to the US taxpayer to back its system up. The final point I would make is I think to prevent a great depression, a second great depression, these bailouts must be done. However, the politics are such today that I'm not sure that the bailouts would be approved by the Trump administration, the Tea Party, uh, or other conservative institutions. Bailouts are very, very unpopular. The Tea Party got started over concerns about the bailouts. So what does that mean? If we don't have bailouts, that means the deluge. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Boy, talk about subsidizing one-way bets and talk about going from reawakening to a rude awakening, huh? Um, and uh, to comment on these papers, first, uh, well, Perry, and then we'll turn to Rob. Perry? Uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, so let me try to pull together some of this, um, just to remind you where we are in this tale of woe. Uh, we, we, be, we began with banks, okay? 
Then we talked about basically the uh, uh, market-based credit system, um, ABS. Then we talked about the derivatives in, through which risks are moved around um, in this market-based credit system. And what I want to mostly talk about, okay, is the actual sort of explicit backstop structure, okay, that is there, hopefully or not, okay, when trouble comes, okay. And in particular, and in particular, uh, the uh, lender of last resort. Um, what we learned, I think, from the global financial crisis um, was that we need to adapt our, our, the operations of the central bank, that what's important in a market-based credit system is not so much lender of last resort as dealer of last resort, the ability to support the liquidity of the kinds of structures that Anastasia was, was, was talking about. And I have tried to uh, crystallize that learning in a reformulation of the, of the Badger principle um, that we are trying to uh, backstop liquidity, not solvency. That is the Badger principle. Um, but markets, not institutions, that's sort of new. Outside spread, not inside spread, that's a version of, of buying low uh, and away from, away from the market. And core, not periphery, I'll come to a little bit more about that in the, in the next slide. Um, I'm not sure to what extent, the, I mean, this is the lesson I take from this, right? And this is the lesson that I urge that people need to take from this. Um, has Congress taken this lesson? You know, I, will we be able to do this? Um, uh, the fact that we have, since the crisis 10 years ago, uh, definitely been using the central bank to goose asset prices, you know, that's not outside spread. Um, and uh, so we violated some of, some of, these, some of these principles al already. Um, and I do think that there's ongoing obstacles to thinking clearly about the modern financial system, and I list some of those there. Um, the uh, continuing sort of conception of banks as intermediaries, um, and internationally, the conception, uh, uh, when I say core, not periphery, I want to want to emphasize what, what Ed, Ed was saying, which is when I say core, that means dollar, okay, is the core of the global system. There's also, of course, a core of the US system, which we'll, which we'll talk about as well. So the triple coincidence assumption um, versus financial globalization, we're living in this global world. We just heard some of the consequences of that, being able to do business in New York and book it anywhere you want. Uh, and I think there are the political economy frame, okay, which, which uh, Ed Greenberger mentions, um, where we're just not at all clear about the relationship between public and private. Um, the Westphalian frame, this notion that all nations are equal and yet all the liabilities of nations are desperately unequal. Um, the money veil frame, which we, which we still teach the students, sort of money is a veil and it's really all about real stuff behind the scenes. And I must say, in this conference, sometimes there's a tons of that. You know, this, this session is the money and finance session, okay, in, in a, in a three-day conference. Um, and uh, so we, we have some learning to do, um, and that can be an obstacle for, for, the, for the operation um, in a time of crisis. Um, are we prepared? Are we not prepared? My next slide um, is, to, is to get to this uh, tiering point, uh, this core versus periphery, and this relates somewhat to what Ed was, Ed was saying there, that bond markets um, naturally are tiered. You see high quality bonds and low quality bonds, and, the, and this credit spread is not just default spread. There's also a liquidity spread there. That markets do by themselves. Okay. But central banks are then an overlay on that, okay, through their collateral frameworks, whether explicit or implicit, um, where they're prepared to take some of these bonds um, as collateral. Um, I'm emphasizing the collateral dimension because of the, the market-based credit system. Um, the consequence of that is that some bonds are preferred over others, okay? And if, you're, and if the bonds you're holding are the ones that are preferred by the central bank, um, they are liquid in a crisis. Um, if your bonds are not preferred by a central bank, they are not liquid in a crisis. So what we have is a system that's elastic at the core and has discipline at the periphery. That is to say, credit expansion at the core, price movement um, in, the, in, in the periphery is how these, is how these imbalances are, are, are resolved. That's true within countries and it's true between countries, okay? And the United States is the core of the global system. What that means in terms of moral hazard, which is the title of our session, okay, um, is that moral hazard is particularly a problem of the core of the system. Okay, and that's sort of what we were what we're hearing. You know, it's the four big banks. It's the core of the system that's the problem, not the periphery. Okay, it's the best credits in the world, if you will. Okay, and which are therefore at the top of the pyramid that are the problem. Okay, not the not not where the risk is. And that I want to emphasize because that's that also was the illusion um, in the global financial crisis. Everyone thought, yes, they knew there were subprime mortgages. They knew they were going to fail at some point, but. Uh, they, they, and they thought there were these low tranches. The problem was in the AAA tranches. 
You know, the problem is at the core of the system, not in the periphery. But I'm not sure that that is even the major source of the problem. <laughs> uh, so now I'm gonna talk about a couple of other emerging areas of, of vulnerability and moral hazard that I think should be on our radar screen. Um, one of the th effects of Dodd-Frank and other regulatory uh, interventions is that funding is now often termed out. Okay, so you're not, you're not borrowing overnight to support a portfolio, you're borrowing at three months, okay. But that has led to expanded use of derivative uh, hedging in order to hedge the interest rate risk residual there. And so we have had quite a bit of expansion of, th these are the swaps, these are the swaps that, 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 that Ed was talking about. Similarly, interbank money markets are now secured, okay, sort of killed the Fed funds market, killed the euro dollar market, and replaced it with foreign exchange swap markets and repo markets. They're secured, okay, um, but are they safer? There are very strange asset price movements, okay, that are, that are emerging. Um, and, and these are untested. It's not at all clear that this regulation is making, is making us safer, not to me. And meanwhile, Anastasia was mentioning how the regulation of, of, of new credit issue um, in the core, okay, in the UK in particular, um, is, is, is reducing credit expansion all the credit that has expanded in the last 10 years is in the emerging markets, okay? It's in the periphery. It's in the periphery. Um, and uh, the, the, this is, the BIS is all over this, paying attention to this, um, the emerging markets debt, debt bubble. At the very same time that all of these emerging market countries are getting much more integrated into the global financial system, and all of this accredited expansion, a very large proportion of it, is in dollars. Where's the backstop of, the, of that dollar expansion in the emerging markets? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. We will find out. Dealer of first resort capacity constraints are limited, um, and uh, dealer of last resort capacity limit, li limitations are untested. This, these liquidity swaps you were mentioning, um, they exist. You know, unlimited uh, permanent swaps between the top six central banks. Um, the handshakes, two-page documents. Will Congress allow this to happen? We'll see. We'll see. But that's not even the thing I'm most worried about right now. <laughs> what I'm most worried about right now is the state of policy. Stabilization policy, okay, in the core of the system, which is to say the United States, um, the, the Federal Reserve, um, seems to me operating as a source of very significant moral hazard in markets right now. Quantitative easing is equivalent to shadow banking, that is to say money market funding of capital market lending on the balance sheet of the central bank, but with the assets deliberately mispriced in order to create stimulus in the economy. Forward guidance is essentially a profit guarantee for dealers, meaning liquidity risk, risk is, to, go, to borrow short and lend long, meaning liquidity risk is mispriced as a tool of policy. Negative interest rate policy is delaying the, over, the, the, the clearing constraint, okay, which is the thing that creates, creates coherence in a market economy. The survival constraint is mispriced. These are policies that are distorting behavior and, and, and uh, speculators are responding to them. The, but I don't wanna put too much emphasis on these prices. We're talking now about exit. Every central bank is talking about exit, you know, getting out of their balance sheet positions, moving interest rates back to normal. That's going to be a big challenge. But the big challenge is not just getting asset prices back to some place where private dealers are willing to take these positions onto their balance sheets. The biggest challenge is institutional change. I think the unfinished business of Dodd-Frank is institutional change, that the times we're living on in now are very much more like the times immediately after World War II where we're trying to put the system back together again institutionally. Okay. This is about what, what requires is reconstituting the uh, system through which liquidity is, is provided, not by central banks, okay, but by private uh, uh, profit maximizing uh, dealers. This is, this is about renegotiating the boundaries between public and private. Those boundaries are completely, are completely enmeshed at the moment. Um, and it's about renegotiating the global hierarchy. Um, what is the relationship between the U.S. and countries farther down? This is, the, we are not even started doing this. Um, so there's a lot of work ahead of us um, in terms of putting, the, putting Humpty back together again, um, even though it's been 10 years. Thank you. Thanks, Perry. Rob? 
<laughs> Everybody yeah. should take a deep breath after that. I was going to say, INET's been in business for eight years. We, about, we better get started. <laughs> uh, I'd like to just talk in, in the large scheme of things. Uh, I think Perry and Anastasia and Ed do a very good job of describing a certain set of, oh, and, and Michael, I'm sorry, Michael's also with us, uh, a certain set of excesses or unresolved potential excesses. And Ed, I know you went into a little bit of, of why they're there. Things like uh, Tom's and my plate in your deck on uh, the opportunity cost of doing good for a civil servant who has a child that someday has to pay $50,000 a year to go to college and things like that. But let me, let me back up for a minute. I think of a central bank or a central bank embedded in a financial regulatory apparatus, meaning perhaps the supervisory or whatever could be outside of the central bank. So clearly the securities regulators are in America. But I think of, let's just call that, let's aggregate that and call a, a central bank centered financial system. And I see three essential tasks. One is macro stabilization business cycle management, that's the standard uh, textbook view of monetary policy. The second is crisis management after the onset of a crisis. And the third is crisis prevention. And I want to talk a little bit about how these things interact and how that interaction is important to society and how the way we manage that interaction is importance to the legitimacy of governance, and the kind of feelings that people have as citizens and voters. The clear evidence, I think, for a long period of time, and Perry, you're more of an economic historian than I am, is that it's easier to restrain inflation than it is to push ourselves out of deflation. The old pushing on a string notion means that the breaking and deflation of bubbles is a place where the central bank's tool bag, the t interest rate policy, is not very effective. That means you shouldn't put yourself in harm's way by having a bubble. Next, crisis management. Tim Geithner gave a pair of Jacobson lecture a little over a year ago where he basically said, if you're at that fork in the road between big banks failing, and as Michael alluded to, going into a depression, or bailing them out, you better be darn good at bailing them out. The problem I have with that is that's not done in isolation. When viewed in the context of moral hazard, the better you are at bailing out, and guaranteeing the more the spreads on the cost of funds for the big banks will be at an advantage, and the bigger bubble you'll be tempted to blow unless you have crisis prevention. And in this world, in the world of, say, Tom Ferguson's research, the biggest problem advanced economies have is crisis prevention. In the moments in the months, in the years before a financial crisis, it is very often the case that both borrowers and lenders will be mad at the regulator that tries to stop the blowing up of the bubble. So now you have this triangle that I talked about of the three interactions. The better you get at crisis management, the more you inspire more risk taking. And the greater is the risk that the bailout is bigger, and when the bubble bursts, macro policy can't handle it. So you have to repair what you talked about as the boundary, what you call the hybridity uh, mm -hmm. between public and private with integrity, or you're gonna have, or you're going to use your fiscal capacity. Now, what Ed did, which was quite interesting, was he talked about how that fiscal capacity 
doesn't quite conform to the old Treaty of Westphalia boundaries. But the United States guarantee system is encouraging forbearance and too big to fail in Europe, which I would conjecture may come at the detriment of things like the Greek citizens. When you're caught in a debt overhang and your creditor isn't forced to take their losses and troikas come in and grind you through the mill, a lot of things happen to your society to extend and pretend the notion that those bonds are solvent. And the more daring the authorities in Europe are likely to be when they know if they guess wrong, if they hit a banana peel, the American guarantee is there to underpin so things don't spiral out of control. Now, um, where, I'm, where I'm very troubled by all of this is that I don't think what happened in 2008 and the inadequate repairs after are really about a financial crisis. I think they are about a crisis of governing legitimacy. The notion of unfairness, the notion that people are bailed out and a year later get bonuses had a lot to do with why Barack Obama's first term lost control of the House of Representatives. It's also why in Massachusetts, a place where Elizabeth Warren now holds a Senate seat, when Senator Kennedy died, it was won by a Republican because that by-election and, and Martha Coakley, the Democratic candidate's pollster, was a good friend of mine. It was one week after Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan announced their bonuses. And people went nuts and they penalized the Democrat. Martha Coakley had nothing to do with the financial sector, but she was a Democrat and it was viewed as done on that watch. These are anecdotes, but the inflammation that produced the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street was related to this sense of injustice. If what we're doing now in the contorted political economy is subsidizing and fortifying money powerful, too big to fail banks. I don't remember the quote or the precise amount, but Winnie Biennema last night talked about somewhere between four and six hundred million dollars a year in lobby expenditure. Dennis, you probably know yeah, from the financial sector. This looks like what a guy named Donald Trump called a rigged system. And so at the core, I think the biggest worry, and I Michael, you really emphasize this. We're putting contingent fiscal capacity on the table with all of these guarantees. And how that system is playing out is being legitimated or justified, I think quite superficially, by suggesting that you can't let things fail in the event of a crisis. Well, you shouldn't put yourself in a place where they can fail, but we can't muscle up to that. Central banks can't muscle up to that. The revolving door inhibits adequate enforcement. And we're pushing ourselves closer and closer to a dreadful set of decisions. One, we reserve and use our contingent fiscal capacity to guarantee a bloated financial sector rather than deal with retirement and education and health and infrastructure. And that applies to any of these countries. And secondly, we run the risk that we continue to demoralize people. And what I think really underpinning the design of this entire vision of this entire conference is something that started to accelerate at the time of the 2008 crisis. And that is an inflammation of, and the despair in a body politic which now is brought into question. Some people are very condescending about how people chose to use their vote out of despair for Donald Trump or Marie Le Pen or for Brexit or for the AFD. The process of, which you might call dealing with traumatized democracy is scaring us all. And if there's anything that I would think poured gasoline on the flames, it would be to go back to the place and make the same mistake a second time. 
and pretend again we didn't see it coming. Thank you very much. Well, that was uh, uh, sobering. We were going to end on a high note, and we, uh, uh, we were going to do that by providing a bailout to all of you, but we decided not to. Um, we've got but, but wait a minute. Didn't, didn't one of them just tell us that the Americans are guaranteeing everything? So all you <laughs> Europeans, we can go out to dinner. It's going to be fun tonight. <laughs> you know, it's one of, the th one of the key things, I think, that Rob mentioned that's worth emphasizing is that people think of the cost of the crisis, whether it's in the U.S. or in the world, in terms of what it costs. Better Markets did a study and said lost GDP is about $20 trillion <laughs> and counting, and it's the same elsewhere. But a very important point that Rob makes are the indirect costs, which is that the massive diversion of that money into the financial sector and then ameliorating the social woes that come out of that um, actually prevents the expenditure and the availability of that money for all of society's other priorities. And so that's what's so fundamentally important about what appears to be this kind of um, uh, cycle and treadmill, actually, of where we're given these implicit guarantees, we've blurred the lines, as Perry was saying, between private and public, and as Rob's saying, is what is happening, and, and you end up with a demoralization from a traumatized uh, democratic electorate across the world. And so the consequences could not be greater, and I think the, and they continue with us today, and they grow each day, and I think naming them, identifying them, and talking about them, as Anastasia, Ed, Michael talked about directly, and then Perry and Rob teased out the implications of, are really one of the most important tasks that we have. And it really ties right back to, that's the awakening we need. We're done through, as Geithner would say, the fire and the response to the fire. And now we think we fireproof the building. And yet, if you listen carefully, what people are saying is, we're actually just putting the kindling back in place. And that's why we need to focus on these subjects so hard. So um, I thought we have very few minutes. I thought we'd go to the audience, if that's OK with the panel, unless somebody feels very strongly about rebutting or responding to anything. Um, so let's, uh, let's go to the audience. If there are any questions, we have a mic over there and a mic over there. Right here. Steve, I think, if, I, if my eyesight is working. I d give your name. So I'm Steve Ramirez. I'm a law professor at Loyola University of Chicago, and I teach and write about Dodd-Frank. So Dodd-Frank included a provision that expanded the Fed's lending capacity under th rule th section 13.3, and they issued final rules November 30th of 2015 to make widely available <laughs> bailouts available in times of economic disruption. And you can look that up on the Fed's web website. My question is this. I think what we're really talking about is contingent monetary capacity, not contingent fiscal capacity. And I really don't know how to get my hands around the limitations to that capacity. In December of 08, it went to about $20 trillion in short-term loans. Now we're talking about supporting the EU banking system too. Could the Fed inject 50, 60, $70 trillion into the global financial sector? and rescue us from a Great Depression, too? Good question, Steve. It's, so it's a f not only fiscal exhaustion of fiscal capacity, but monetary, too, Ed. Well, I mean, the way we are running the Federal Reserve is, it is doing fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. If you uh, provide a loan at an inappropriate interest rate, a too low interest rate to a troubled bank, you are giving away taxpayer money. And, and so it's almost like welfare for the banks as opposed to welfare for a troubled person. That I would, I'd like to just say something that, about Timothy Geithner, that, that this man was in a very tough place, but he didn't have the philosophic training, the, the kind of training, that, the kind of discussion that we just had here from Rob of understanding what the long-term consequences of, of this complete hair, no haircut policy was. I don't know why he didn't think he, think he could have given 10% haircuts. Hmm. Or and, any at and, all. Well, I mean, no. I'm just saying, if you take his mindset, he's, not, he's going to subsidize the system. Hmm. But why so completely? Why? Because it simplified his job. 
it's very easy to give away money. It's hard. Think of it as a parent. You know, you punish a child. You, you, you're thinking you're doing something good for the child in the long run, but it's much easier to ignore the behavior. Rob? I think uh, I saw Andrew Shing. Are you, yeah, there you are. Uh, we've been in a meeting the last couple of days where about every 15 or 20 minutes, you perk up, smile, and say, well, they'll just print money. So I thought maybe you'd want to answer Steve's question about are we <laughs> using monetary capacity or fiscal capacity or running a long-term risk of inflation from uh, running the presses to the, float the uh, financial sector? What are the risks? The reason why I've been silent, and I totally agree with the discussion, the underlying issue behind all this is that central bankers got dragged in because we didn't want to face the political conse consequences of restructuring the zombie banks. So the central bank de facto guaranteed the liability side of every single bank de facto. Mm. You know, it's no longer too large to fail, it's too small to fail. And having bet the bank, as it, if you really want to say this, the only issue is how much do you want to print? Mm. <laughs> right? And, and so the, 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 the point is, it's not just the Fed wanting to deny the, the, put the responsibility on the US taxpayers. The Japanese are willing to fund mm. as much as possible uh, the holding of, of American bonds at very, very low interest rates. Mm. And uh, so, you know, we have a, a kind of a perpetual uh, machine out there for which we do not know what is the trigger that will cause the collapse, as it were. Uh, I totally agree with, you know, uh, I think it's Anastasia's uh, argument about we've shifted. I mean, we haven't changed the game. What was the game? The game is that we've subsidized debt, and if you try to regulate it, they put it off balance sheet. If you regulate some more, you push it offshore. Mm -hmm. And then you have a great convenience of saying it's all shadow banking. You mean the shadow banks were not regulated? The shadow banks were right in front of you. Basically, it was a very convenient excuse for all the central banks and the regulators to say, don't blame me, it's all the shadow banks. <laughs> And so it was a very beautiful political uh, slate of hand to deny responsibility. So we have a wonderful pretense of stability. Uh, you know, that's all I can say. I mean, and I've gone silent on this particular problem because none of the so-called responsible financial papers and journals are willing to discuss this issue. Thank you very much. You know, I'm. I let me just make a quick and, Andrew, I'm a little bit concerned because, as you know, for the intro and outro of each session, I try to control the music playlist, and I forgot to include the song Don't Worry, Be Happy for this session. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, one, we got time for one more question right here. If you could identify yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Pablo Borz from the National University of San Martin in Argentina. I have a question from, uh, for Professor Nesvetailova uh, on assets, risk, and alternatives. Uh, now emerging markets uh, are facing this inflow of money from Europe, from Asia, that don't have an outlet, like you mentioned, in the, uh, in the supply of assets to invest, so they come to uh, many emerging economies. What uh, now? They are issuing different types of assets with different risk. As you mentioned, not every asset has the same risk, so we need to look out into that. What alternatives do we have uh, in emerging economies to, uh, add, to direct those inflows into assets which are with risk more manageable for the capacities and capabilities of our markets and our governments, which are rather small and, and train most, most of them in handling those, uh, those inflows. That Thank would you. be my question. Thank you. Right now? Um, gosh, that's a political economy question. You need to construct a political economy that could accommodate that demand, because at the moment, all of that demand is channeled into US assets. 
the capital markets there are underdeveloped. Uh, Europeans are desperately trying to construct their own capital market, and it, it's, it hasn't been going superbly at all. Um, and the, you know, there is no liquidity, there is no alternative. But it's not just about a cre creation of an asset, even in the form of a bond. You, you actually need the infrastructure and the institutions and a believable future. In fact, Latin America, on that graph of asset under management growing, is the topest, is the most top line. It's been growing most aggressively in terms of um, wealth being managed. So it's a very serious problem. And the answer is not just about one isolated element. It's, it's about fighting poverty. It's about creating assets. Mm. It's about you know, ensuring the future. It's about state building. Uh, thank you. Um, we're gonna, uh, Rob's going to talk, has a couple of things that he wants to say to wrap up. But first, let me say thank you to everybody on the panel. Um, and thank you, Michael, for coming in. We appreciate you coming in thank by you. video. Uh, Anastasia's got to run to catch a train. And Rob's going to make a few comments. Sure. So feel free to run. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, how do I say, the ending of the plenary. And those of you who were at lunch heard me start to, uh, to thank people who had been extremely helpful. We've had a group that helps our staff with all of the video and production issues, including Bales Carlin, Sarah Testerman, Taylor J., Andrew Burnett, Chuck and Remy, Mars, and Andreas Wagner. At a deeper foundational level, there are two groups of people that I really want to thank, and they are the founders, Jim Balsilli, his foundation CG, and uh, Rohit Madora, who's on our governing board, who plays a very active and constructive role in collaborating with INET, going back to our very first meeting. Bill Janeway, one of our founders, who you've seen in the program, is an extraordinary backer and a rebel thinker, and George Soros, who provided a tremendous amount of financial freedom and content freedom to this whole enterprise. And I want to thank him for trusting us for all these years. I want to thank the two young men that run the Young Scholars Initiative. You felt the injection of intensity and enthusiasm during these last couple, three days. And before that, there were two days of a Young Scholars Conference down at the Corn Exchange where eight, 900 people came in. They constructed booths. In particular, one of our staff members, Gonzalo Fonseca, created a magnificent tour in the history of economic thought. And this exhibit and his website on the history of economic thought are just gold mines. And we'll, we'll be featuring those on the website in the days to come. And finally, indirectly, I want to thank the Nobel Prize Committee for the year 2001. And that's because George Akerlof, Joe Stiglitz, and Michael Spence, who shared the Nobel Prize that year, are tremendous, tremendous advisors and backers to INET. Thank you all.